but we're dealing with the subject of evolution here. And uh, the question is, how did the bodies of living organisms come into being in the first place? So bodies of living organisms can be compared with complicated machines. In fact, the uh, Bhagavad Gita even makes that comparison, yantra rudani maya ya, the uh, word yantra means a machine. And actually, uh, in the old days in India, uh, there were rather complicated machines, not just bullock carts necessarily. Uh, I have an interesting little article written by some King Bojadev in the medieval period in Sanskrit. It's not a Shastra, it's just a secular piece of writing. But he's describing how the kings would have various uh, automata in their palaces. Uh, these are robots. Uh, but these weren't for the purpose of modern industrial development. They were mainly just for show and enjoyment. So, for example, it was described that they would have such a thing as a robot door opener. Uh, of course, we have these in supermarkets today. But this was fancier, uh, as is befitting for a king. <laughs> so you'd have this uh, um, uniformed soldier standing next to the door. At least it would look like a soldier, but actually it wasn't a real soldier. And as you walk towards the door, he would lean over and open the door for you and close it after you. But actually the whole thing was a machine. And it was run apparently hydraulically. There was a tank of water overhead. And as you approached the door, you'd step on a certain stone slab that would move down slightly and open a valve. And then through the action of water flowing through this apparatus, the, the whole thing would operate. So, actually one can build machines like that. Uh, you know, with a bit of engineering skill, you could see how to do it. So apparently, uh, well, there are documents describing such things in India. Uh, and I don't, I don't know exactly in what period, but a long time ago. So anyway, the idea of machines was not so novel. So the uh, Bhagavad Gita describes the body as a machine. But of course, it describes that there's also the soul and the super soul. And of course, there's the subtle body as well as the gross body. Uh, the subtle body, however, also is essentially mechanical in nature. It's uh, not living. So it's also a kind of machine. But the scientists, of course, only know about the gross machinery. So, and they're very much preoccupied with studying the machinery of the gross body. And they think that that's the all in all. They believe that life is simply that machinery and that's all that is there. Now, as it turns out, the machinery in, the, in a living body is exceedingly complex. We were talking about that previously. I'll just explain what this picture is, by the way. See this picture here of a protein molecule in the beginning of this Life from Chemicals article. Well, this is a simplified diagram of a protein molecule. We show in here a scientist looking a little lost. But uh, actually, this looks like a ribbon, like a sort of Christmas ribbon that's coiling around. But actually, this stands for a sequence of amino acids, which are certain kinds of molecules that are linked together in a chain. And the chain, the ribbon follows the sort of path of the chain. So you can imagine these rather odd-shaped objects arranged in a chain fashion and going around following this path. So that's what the whole thing is. So it has a very complicated structure, as you can see from the the picture, if you imagine that actually this picture is a great simplification of what it really is. And in even a bacterial cell, there are thousands of different kinds of structures like this. And each one is there in maybe thousands of copies. But there are thousands of different types. This small inset shows some of the different kinds of structures that exist.
And actually, for the sake of the artist, we just chose some that were simple. Uh, if we chose the complicated ones, then the picture would be too complicated and it wouldn't be good artistically. So we didn't even show the really complex ones. So the uh, machinery of the living body is exceedingly complicated. And the fact is that no one really even can make a model of how it works, what to speak of explaining how it came into being. So I was just talking with a scientist yesterday who came to visit me here uh, about the whole question of making models of how uh, organisms actually work. Uh, we were also discussing the question of whether you could get funding for that from the different scientific agencies that are uh, run by the government and which determine uh, the flow of government funds for scientific research. So we were discussing whether the people who are investigating the origin of life would approve such funding. Because what happens is that if you make a request for funding, it's sent out to prominent scientists in the field of research that you're interested in, and they say whether it's a good proposal or not. And if, it, if they approve of it, then you can get funding, and otherwise you can't. So uh, the point that came up, though, was that uh, they would never or they'd be highly unlikely to approve of uh, investigations in which you try to make models of how organisms work. Uh, and one might want, I wonder why don't they want to look into that? Of course, I can provide a, uh, an intuitive reason as to why they wouldn't want to look into that. Because the moment you really try to do it, you'll see that organisms are so complicated that the whole idea of evolution will become ludicrous. So, in order to have a theory of evolution, it's better to keep things vague. As long as an organism is a sort of vague, nebulous thing that you just imagine in a fuzzy sort of way, then you can imagine how it can evolve. Because anyone can imagine a sort of cloud of fuzz gradually changing shape from one thing into another. But, uh, if you have an actual machine with moving parts that interact with one another, then how can you change that into something else, gradually, step by step? You know, you can take a wristwatch, or a sewing machine, or an automobile engine, and imagine changing that step by step into something else. For example, let's say we want to change a sewing machine into an automobile engine. Well, there are two organized structures. So, how could you do it? Now, the requirement is that at each step along the way, as you change the sewing machine into the automobile engine, you have to have a machine that works and does something. So, could you do it? That's a homework problem. Uh, you see, one thing scientists don't like are negative criticisms, in which you just challenge them to do something. They'll say, well, prove to me that I can't do it. But uh, the real question, so they'll try and turn the tables on you and say, well, you can't prove that you couldn't transform a sewing machine into an automobile engine step by step. Uh, so therefore, maybe it's possible. There might be intermediate stages you could go through. So they'll make that challenge. But actually, though, uh, where does the burden of proof lie in this matter? Because actually, we have no re basis in experience to think that you could make a transformation like that. Uh, there's no particular reason to think you could do it. Uh, so surely if someone says you can do it, then they're obliged to show how you can do it. Uh, in, in courts, they have this idea of the burden of proof. Who has to prove a given proposition? If you have a given proposition, then there are two positions that can be taken. One person can try and prove that it's true, and another person can try to prove that it's false. So then the question comes as to, well, which kind of proof should we require here? That decision always has to be made. So we would argue that certainly, if someone wants to say you can make such a transformation from one machine into another, then 
the person saying you can do that should provide the proof of that it's only reasonable so you can give many examples of this kind of transformation so the picture we have in the beginning of this article illustrates this basic point so we have two things here one is we have a series of skulls from an ape like skull here to a regular human skull here and then in between we have various intermediates now you can imagine gradually changing the ape skull into the human skull all you do is gradually make the cranium a bit larger and you shrink the jaws in and make the bones less heavy and less thick gradually and you can go from the ape skull to the human skull so people will say well that's how evolution works that's simple no problem but there's more involved in changing an ape into a human being than that now the trouble here is that people don't know how apes and human beings really work as machines so one can think of an ape or a human being as a sort of amorphous thing like a clay model in which you can just mold it and gradually change shapes of things and you go from one to the other but is it that simple take the brain for example so we have here a picture of a brain so it looks pretty amorphous if you just look at it in the gross way it looks kind of like a cloud you can see floating in the sky and you can imagine a cloud growing in fact some clouds do that if you look at them you'll see it's gradually growing and changing shape so you can think of the brain similarly changing from an ape brain into a human brain but then if you ask well how does the brain work you can stop and think well the brain is supposed to be like a computer so they say now nobody really knows this by the way because uh, no one can observe the functioning of the brain on the, the level of the cellular interactions on a large scale and show how it actually works as a computer so it's just an idea that people have but let's say it does work as a computer so next to the brain we show here a computer circuit of the kind you'll find in your Apple computer or something so the nature of such a circuit is that many little things have to link together in just the right order and the functioning of the circuit depends on how they're linked together so obviously ape brains function in a different way than human brains obviously as you can see from the difference between behavior of humans and apes for example humans can learn to speak which is a fairly remarkable thing if you think about it because a child about one to two years old who doesn't know anything about language can figure out how to speak a language just by hearing other people doing it that's pretty remarkable if you consider that even as an adult if you hear somebody else speaking a language it's hard to learn how to speak it even if if someone's there to teach you the grammar but a child can figure it out without anybody explaining grammar to him because of course they can't explain grammar to him since he can't speak <laughs> so the human let's say this is due to the functioning of the brain that's what the biologist was saying so that means the brain has to have a built-in program that can uh, learn how to speak a language just by hearing the sounds coming in and this is uh, involves many remarkable features for example we take it for granted that when somebody speaks English words that it's easy to, to distinguish between the words and tell one word from another but actually that requires subtle discriminations uh, for example I was just visiting Japan so I was hearing these people speak Japanese so I asked somebody well how do you say this and he said blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> Actually, it was more like Masha Gawashkafawa or something. <laughs> and the fact is, I couldn't even begin to try to say it because I didn't know what the sounds were that you had to make. Because you obviously had to make certain sounds in a certain way. And I had no idea what sounds you were supposed to try to make because they weren't like English sounds at all. But the 
the infant who doesn't know how to speak at all can figure out what sounds you're supposed to make. So if you think of programming a computer to do that, uh, it would be very difficult. Now, you see, it's worthwhile thinking about how you would actually do it. Because as I was saying, as long as the organism remains something vague and fuzzy, uh, you can easily imagine that it would evolve. Uh, just like the idea of the cloud changing shape. But if you think of actually doing it, then you run into problems. So you may ask, well, what does it take to program a computer, say, to recognize sounds and, uh, and so on and so forth? Well, this is very difficult. In fact, uh, people are working on building computers that will respond to spoken commands. Uh, very complicated programs are needed. Uh, now, in a computer program, uh, what you find is that the structure you build is sensitive to errors. In a computer program, these are called bugs. So what you find is you can have a program that really works very nicely, but there can be one little bug in it, one little error. And because of that, the whole thing breaks down. Errors can multiply. For example, you know, if you do arithmetic and you add up and multiply numbers, if you make one little mistake somewhere, you can be way off in your final calculation. Because mistakes can just multiply through the calculation. Well, it's exactly like that in computer programs. Uh, if one little thing goes wrong, then there can be a reaction in which that causes something else and that causes something else. So the whole thing can go off. So computer programs are very complicated arrangements of interacting parts, so to speak, and they have to be made just right. So how can you change one computer program into another? Well, it's not easy. It, it, it requires rewriting, essentially. So let's say the brain of the ape is like a computer program, and it's wired in such a way that the connections of the cells represent the logical structure of the program, which is what people are thinking. And let's say the human brain is another program. It's wired differently. So you have to go from the ape wiring to the human wiring. And you have to introduce a whole new set of functions, namely language comprehension, which just aren't there in the ape. Uh, by the way, they try to teach apes language. And apes can, it's interesting, chimpanzees can learn to use signs in various remarkable ways. But it's been observed that they never actually learn language. The idea of grammar never occurs to the ape. You can present it with examples of grammar for years, and it never begins to speak grammatically. It can merely make signs in a sort of one-for-one -one fashion, like this stands for banana, or this stands for something. And it can Not even... Sign. Stand sign language. Yeah, it can use sign language. You can use sign language for the deaf. They've done this. Apes also cannot produce sounds the way humans can. Uh, it's interesting. They can't produce words. They say it's due to the structure of their, their throats. But the thing is, if you can't produce words one way, then you can produce them in another way. And they have a tongue and a throat and so on, so they could make some kind of patterned sounds. But they never learn to do that either. But they can make hand symbols like the language for the deaf and make symbols for, for banana and want. And uh, so the ape will make something like, want, 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 banana, banana, banana. And, then, <laughs> and you know what it wants. <laughs> it can do that. But it can't say something like, uh, I would have wanted a banana if I were hungry. You know, it'll never come up with anything like that. Or, uh, so anyway, uh, actually, Efforts have been made to program computers to use language. And just to give you an idea, somebody programmed a computer once to make statements about stacks of toy blocks. And you could actually type in on a typewriter a question like, uh, is there a red block on top of a green block? And it would, the computer would analyze the scene of blocks and say, yes or no correctly, depending on what the situation was. So uh, this was considered to be a great triumph of
programming when it first came out. Uh, I once asked a man at MIT how big the program was, and he gave me a figure in man hours of programming time. Uh, it was hundred. It took thousands of man hours or something. In other words, several people worked for a couple of years on the system or something like that. So it was exceedingly complicated. But what it could do was very rudimentary. And I also asked him, well, suppose instead of dealing with blocks, we want the program to answer similar questions about, say, items in a, in a kitchen, like pots, glasses, spoons, salt shakers, things like that. And he said, well, that's just completely impractical at the present stage. We have no idea how to do that. Because then you have to analyze all kinds of curved shapes, and it's not easy. For example, we can look at a salt shaker and immediately, just in a flash, without any observable time lag, we can say, oh, that's a salt shaker. We can see a salt shaker amidst various spoons, rolling pins, and things like that, and say, oh, there's the salt shaker. But try to program a computer to do that. At present, nobody can do it. It's completely out of the question. So, um, but yet a, a young child can do that without any difficulty. Uh, so, the kind of programming that must exist in the brain, if indeed the brain is what is entirely doing this, is of incredible sophistication. So, they're just speculating when they say that programming of the brain is doing these things, as a matter of fact. Nobody has ever demonstrated that. But let's suppose it is. Well, here we gave a, an example of a much simpler problem of evolution. Because you can ask, could we change the brain from, say, the ape brain to the human brain by evolutionary steps? Well, let's try a simpler problem. Here we have two radio circuits, like Heathkit circuits, which you can put together. So there's one and there's another. So could you change one radio circuit into another by gradual step-by-step -step changes? What would be involved in that? And mind you, at each stage, the circuit has to work. That is, you make a little change, and it's a working circuit. And another little change, and it's still a working circuit. And in this way, you go from your first circuit all the way to your second circuit. That's the thing that's required, because in evolution, that's what you have to do to change, because the animals have to be viable. Generation by generation, the organisms have to be able to function in their environment. It's not that you can take the, the ape brain and sort of partially disassemble it into something in which the parts are laid out on a table or something, uh, and then reassemble it in a, in a completely new way. No, at each step it has to be workable. Well, I would suggest that if you try to do that with, say, some radio circuits, as we show in this picture here, you won't be able to do it step by step. If you wanted to actually change one circuit into another, what you'll have to do is take apart the first circuit into its components, and then rearrange the components in a completely new way to make a completely new circuit. You'll have to change many things at once. And the reason you have to change many things at once is that in the circuit, uh, things are interdependent. One part depends on what many other parts are doing. So if you change the one part, you also have to change many other parts in order to get something that works. This is the way machines are. So, and it's especially true of complicated machines. For example, you know, if you want to change a computer program to make some minor modification, in what the program does. Typically, you have to change it in a quite a number of different places, because one change here requires a change there, and that requires a change over here, and so on. So you have to rewrite quite a few things in order to, to make even a minor change. And to introduce a completely new function, then you have to do extensive writing of whole new routines and so forth. So this is the, the problem of evolution. If you try and actually specify what happens uh, in an exact way, then you find that it's very difficult to evolve one thing into another. Now, uh, evolutionists are always going to be fond of pointing to things where it's not so difficult to make a change. Take, for example, color patterns on, on the backs of beetles. 
I was talking to a paleontologist at the British Museum, and uh, we were talking about evolution. And so he mentioned that uh, it used to be that if, when people knew about a few hundred species of beetles, that they would see that there were quite a number of distinct color patterns. And he said, well, you could say that how could one of these color patterns change into another? But in more recent years, we have studied beetles in greater depth, and we've discovered literally thousands of species of beetles. I think they may have something like a hundred, maybe 400,000 species of beetles now that they've recorded. <laughs> Actually, there are people who, who do this, believe it or not. <laughs> but they're, they're actually, you will find persons, usually you find them in museums, who, uh, who can actually say that they have personally looked at 4,000 or maybe, well, I don't think one person could look at 100,000 species of beetles, but maybe one person has specialized in a certain subgrouping, and he has personally looked at 1,000 different types of beetles, and he can make drawings of all of them. So, anyway, actually, when we were doing research for this magazine, we once took out a book on lizards. It was a book about this thick, and it was about a particular kind of lizard, mind you. And the whole book was on these lizards. And after reading that, your mind would be deeply immersed in lizard consciousness. <laughs> Actually, you would begin to intuitively feel what it is like to be a lizard. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he was saying that when you look at so many different beetles, then you see that the patterns practically merge into one another in a continuum. And so we can see easily how by evolution one can change into another. Well, as a matter of fact, that's all well and good. As far as such patterns are concerned, maybe you can gradually change one into another. After all, they're just little color markings on the back of the, the beetle shell. But now what about other features of the beetle, such as the multi-jointed legs or the eyes made of thousands of lenses with special little photoreceptors that link together in some kind of neuron network so that the beetle can recognize different things? Uh, and, and walk around and so forth. What about all that? So the evolutionist points to the color patterns and you can easily see how you can merge one color pattern into another. That's just like the clouds in the sky gradually changing shape. So conceivably that could even happen by an evolutionary process. Maybe it did or maybe it didn't. Uh, it's conceivable. But what about the, the machinery of the beetle itself? That's another thing. So the idea is they will emphasize these things that maybe could change gradually. Not that they necessarily did, but they leave out the discussion of all this machinery because nobody has any idea how that could change gradually. So uh, these are some of the, the problems involved with evolution. Uh, now the whole discussion of evolution involves many different claims and counterclaims. Uh, the discussion is generally carried out within this realm of vagueness. And the evolutionists within this realm will try to make a plausible case. So, and they'll make some rather astonishing assertions. For example, I was just reading, actually it was in this newspaper article Badri Narayan gave me. Uh, this fellow named uh, Dr. Root Bernstein, who spent three years at the Salk Institute here, uh, studying creationism versus evolution. It's interesting that you can study that here at the Salk Institute. This was for the purpose of refuting the creationists. So he made the claim that you couldn't even conduct modern research without the theory of evolution. Because in modern medical research, we, do, uh, we test drugs on animals like rats. And the reason we're able to do this is that we know the animals, uh, the rats, respond to drugs in much the same way that human beings do. And we couldn't even understand this without the theory of evolution that explains how the rats have a common ancestor with human beings, and therefore they're very similar to human beings. 
So he actually gave this argument. But actually, this argument is completely wrong. Because, as a matter of fact, the theory of evolution does not tell you that rats should respond to drugs the same way human beings do. In fact, it would suggest that they shouldn't respond to drugs the same way human beings do, because evolution means change. That's what evolution actually means, basically. So why then should the rats have the same response to drugs that the humans do? They should change over the course of millions of years and respond differently. After all, they look different. They are different in many ways, so why should they respond to drugs the same way? So the fact is, if they do respond to drugs the same way, that's just an empirical observation. And you'll see the most ludicrous arguments are being put forward. So there are many different arguments. But basically, the evolutionists don't know what's going on. And we give some examples here to illustrate this. I'll just indicate some of them. For example, some evolutionists will say that given time, human beings will definitely evolve. And they will even say that if mammals had not been given their chance to evolve due to the extinction of the dinosaurs, then some dinosaurs would have evolved into human beings by now. So this is what they would look like. We have a picture. Now, yeah? This may not be appropriate to ask them, but I always wondered, why don't we see, if evolution is an ongoing process, why don't we see happy old people? Why don't we see all the intermediate steps? Why is it that evolution... Why don't we see missing links or something like this? Well, the answer they'll give to that, you see, is competition. The half-evolved person can't compete with the fully-evolved person. Well, why don't we see them now? Why don't we see that... Maybe we... ...ones that are being worked out of the system but still haven't quite been completely shut out by competition. Well, you see, the argument will be made, we do see them. But, of course... Come to the Sunday feast, you know. Well, in the subways of New York... Well, no, the argument actually will be made that we do see them, actually. Except that now, nowadays, we're in the age of liberalism in human society. And one isn't supposed to refer to inferior races anymore. But if we were having this conversation a hundred years ago, then the immediate answer would be, well, there are the inferior races. And even now, they're in the process of being eliminated by natural selection. That's exactly what people would have said. But in more recent times, it's considered to be socially just not acceptable to say things like that, although a lot of people still are thinking that way. But the basic argument... Because, you see, what happened after Darwin came up with his theory, there was something called social Darwinism. And in the early part of the 20th century, it became very prominent. And the whole idea of social Darwinism was, well, look, let's eliminate the inferior human beings. This is the natural process of evolution. And so this was used as justification for all kinds of things, including, you know, moving into a country where you have greater military power and taking over, because the people there are inferior, after all. After all, it's survival of the fittest, and the fact that we're fittest is proven by the fact that we beat them. So this kind of thing was used. So more recently, it's become unpopular to use that kind of argument. But in any case, that's the argument they'll give. We don't see the intermediate forms because they didn't survive. They weren't fit. So, yeah? Are there any things in intermediate forms that means we exist in the forms before the intermediate form? Why are they still existing? Why hasn't everything in the intermediate forms ceased to exist? Well, then the answer to that is there are many niches in nature. The explanation they'll give is that if two beings are similar in form, then there tends to be strong competition between them, and the inferior one will be quickly eliminated. But if a large difference has arisen, then there's not so much competition because the organisms are acting in different spheres. For example, how is it you can have gorillas and human beings at the same time? 
well, the gorillas live way out in the jungle somewhere where the human beings don't go. Uh, so therefore, there's not so much competition between human beings and gorillas, and you can have both. So that's the explanation. And if you say, well, what about when the human beings weren't so different from the, the semi-gorillas, and they were competing? Well, the answer would be, well, in those days, there wasn't much population, so the two groups just wound up in different parts of Africa, and they didn't compete with one another, and they evolved in their separate ways, and only recently have they really come into contact again, because the human population has expanded so much. But in due time, maybe in the next few years, the gorillas will probably die out, because now they are comp in competition with the human beings. And in fact, unless they're protected by legislation and so on, they'll be exterminated. So that's the kind of argument that will be made. So if someone says, if you give the argument, well, then why are the monkeys still here? Well, the answer is, well, the monkeys are living out in the, in the treetops. And the other primates that evolved into human beings are living on the ground, let's say. So there's not so much competition between them. So this kind of argument is given. Yeah? They say that at a certain time, for a certain reason, that monkey evolved in another more advanced form of life. Yeah. Under certain circumstances. But they understand what those, cir they understand what those circumstances are, and those circumstances arise again, which would cause monkeys to at another time in the present. Well, that was the point I was just about to make. Uh, you could ask... Now you're going back to the dinosaur man. You get, to back, you get back to the dinosaur man. This illustrates what the evolutionists don't know, because you see, some evolutionists will say, given certain circumstances, a human-like being will evolve. Even if you start with dinosaurs, a dinosaur man will evolve, and here he is. Now, by the way, we made this model, but actually we copied a model made by some scientists. We asked permission to use their model, and they wouldn't give it, but, so we just made a, another one ourselves. But uh, this is what it looked like, basically. So they were saying, yeah, sure, given the same circumstances, a man-like being will evolve. But then we quote in here some other scientists who say, given the same circumstances, a man-like being won't evolve because it's so improbable it just would never happen again the same way. Which means they haven't the faintest idea. So the real answer to your question is, they don't have the faintest idea what circumstances would cause apes to evolve into a man, or cause uh, whatever it was, insectivores to evolve into a monkey, or anything like that. This is an area of sheer speculation. And it's in the realm of total vagueness. So it's anybody's guess. So the evolutionists will make all kinds of guesses continuously. Uh, for example, their guess concerning how it is that mammals came about with milk glands. They will say, well, there were some lizards that tended to sweat. And the young lizards would lick the body of the, the mother. <laughs> and they would get a little nutrient benefit there. But then gradually, changes occurred so that more nutrients went into the sweat, right? <laughs> and in this way, gradually. So, so what is the scientific validity of that? Well, that's what's called a, a just-so story. And anybody can make up such stories. Actually, that's where the, the situation of the theory of evolution. No one has any idea why these, these things should happen. Uh, and they speculate like anything. So, uh, there are many examples. Uh, Evolutionists will make various arguments, though. Some evolutionists will say that because organisms can be classified in hierarchical groups, this indicates they came from common ancestors. Like you can find big, large groups like birds, mammals, reptiles. And then within the birds, there are, say, finches and uh, um, you know, birds of prey and so on. And within that, there are other groups. Uh, and so on. So they will say, well, this shows descent from common ancestors. But not necessarily. We showed here with automobiles, you can make similar classifications according to descent. But this didn't happen by common ancestry. It happened by design. Because it's natural 
in designing machines to divide them into classifications and then modify designs within certain classifications and so on. It's a natural way to organize things. Even when you write essays, you divide them into subheadings like one, two, and three, and under that, under two, you'll have A, B, and C, and under that, you'll have subdivisions and so on. So that is uh, an argument. I'll just indicate some of the arguments that we illustrate here in the pictures. Uh, we have this picture showing development of the embryo. So, once again, if you're going to say how something evolved, then uh, you should at least be able to say how it actually develops uh, in, in its ordinary functioning. Uh, so the human body, or the body of an animal and so on, evolves from the, the embryo, through, from the fertilized egg and so on. They don't know how that works. Uh, they're just, they know a few things about it, but basically they don't know. So, uh, how then can you say how the thing came to be if you don't even know how it works now? That's just one argument. And yet to figure out how it works would take a tremendous development in knowledge. Uh, then we give simple examples, like this is the E. coli motor, which maybe I've talked about before. So give intermediate steps leading up to that. It's a fairly simple mechanism. So please explain how it evolved by showing the intermediate steps. So, uh, yeah? Couldn't we say, because your argument is that each step needs to be fruitful or, or positive or whatever, functioning at least, you know, whatever, or benef benefits the organism, each right. progressive alteration. <clears throat> Couldn't you say that these things breed in such large amounts that you can afford it, like a, like a certain amount of dust, so to speak? Like if I, if there's, if there's, a, if there's a very large population, each one has a different type of variation. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be successful just by the, by the laws of averages. Some will be failures and some will be successful. So if I have enough offspring or enough whatever you call it, it doesn't, if, if there's a certain amount of duds, that's no problem. Let them die off. But there will be a certain number that are successful. So yeah. it doesn't mean that every step has to be successful. It means that there just has to be enough successful steps. No, that's wrong. Your reasoning is wrong. Okay. Because... If you have the successful ones and then some duds come, uh, the successful ones that are there at the time simply dominate everything and they remain the same. And okay, you have some duds that appear and they die off. Well and good. But where is the progressive change from one step to another? You have one kind of success. Who's that dud? Yeah. Breathe and produce something that was it. In other words, you can have like a black and white, black and white, black and white. You can have a success and a failure, but it moved it closer towards your design you're aiming for, and it breeded with a little alteration. That was a success, so it was kept intact. And that one may have adjusted. There was a dud, but it breeded and carried on the dud, which was all moved into a success. Couldn't you? So say let's that? say that to change something from A to B, you have to go through ten steps. Okay. And let's say during each generation you can have one step. And let's say that until you get to the tenth step, it's a dud. So you have to go through... Well, why does it have to be so extreme? Why can't there be small successes and small successes? That's steps? precisely what we're talking about. Can you go by small steps in which each one is successful? Look, you've got, you can just consider what the possibilities are. Either you go by one big change and produce your... Let's take this, this little motor problem here. You go by one big change and you get the whole motor all in one step. Fine. Then it, it works and you've got a new organism that's successful. However, you have to put all these different parts together. The chances of that are exceedingly small. So practically no scientist is even going to, to advocate that one, that idea. That's the hopeful monster theory. You know, the lizard gives birth to a bird with wings and feathers and so on that flies. <laughs> uh, that's really extreme, but here, here's this little motor. The bacterium one day gives birth to a, which doesn't have motors, gives birth to one that has a motor. In other words, it starts building motors all of a sudden. So, 
uh, one can explore that. So I propose that that's going to be too improbable. Okay, let's say you have to go to the motor through 10 steps. 10 isn't such a big number. I don't think that 10 would be enough. You'd need more, probably. But let's say 10 steps. So if each step produces something that works, then fine, you can go step by step. So I ask you, show me 10 steps in which each step produces something that works and that gives you a motor at the end. And it starts with the bacteria without the motor. But I say, take your 10 steps, but allow, with each step, you have 100 alterations, 100 variations, 99 of which don't work, but one of those work. The point is, if you've got, never mind what other alterations there are that don't work, we know there are always plenty of those. But if there's a chain of 10 steps in which each successive step does work, then you could argue you can go through that sequence. But I'm asking you, is there such a thing as a chain of 10 steps in which each step does work? Now, there may be billions. Well, in other words, you're saying. Is there any pathway? There can be billions of other things that don't work. We know that's true anyway. But can you find me one pathway? of 10 steps in which each step does work. But, I hate to reveal my stupidity, but <laughs> could you have, a, let's say you take this little one cell thing. Yeah. Couldn't it just have some little, which is eventually going to become a motor or a rudder, couldn't it just have an arm that serves no purpose at all? It's a dud. Okay, so there's but a dud. But in its next generation down, it, it has an next step that's positive. So in other words, I don't Okay, now I'm what you're saying is, you're saying, okay, we're going to do the following thing. We're going to take two steps. The first one is a dud, and the second one building on that is positive. Exactly. So, the next one may be a dud, the next one may be positive. Okay, show me an example of that. Build this motor that way. Okay, every other step is allowed to be a dud. Try it. But even there, you're going to have problems with evolution. Because, as I already explained, if one step is a, is a dud, uh, that means that bacterium is at a disadvantage. It's producing, it's using its energy to produce something which isn't valid, viable for it. So another bacterium that's using its energy more efficiently is going to reproduce faster. Why? But let's just say, though, that uh, maybe due to some chance arrangement, you just have a group of those that have the dud form, and they're isolated from the other kind, so they don't have to compete with them. Okay. So, but I still ask you, find me a sequence in which every other one is a dud, and you, but every other one, though, is viable. And uh, you can go from the motor not being there to the motor being there. Or for that matter, find me a sequence in which you have uh, uh, three in a row are duds, and then something that's better, and then three in a row are duds, and then something is better, and so on. In other words, actually build models and, and, uh, and show this. Actually show such a sequence. But in theory, it's possible or not possible? In theory, anything is possible. <laughs> if the theory is vague enough. And that's the point. <laughs> Evolution theory thrives on vagueness. As long as you can keep things vague, you can say, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be that. And ultimately, you say to the person, if you, do if you doubt it, you religious fanatic, then you prove that it couldn't be. Always the answer will be, there could be some intermediates. It could happen somehow. Uh, and you can't prove that it couldn't be. Uh, therefore, we go on accepting that it is, and we teach it to all the children that this is what happened, that it happened by evolution. So the idea, the strategy of evolutionary theory is to keep everything vague and say, well, it could be, and then force the person who wants to disagree to prove that it couldn't be. And if you're keeping everything vague and you're dealing with very complicated things, then you can't prove that it couldn't be. Because how can you prove anything where everything is vague and the reality is so complex that nobody knows how it works anyway? So that's the strategy. If you want to advocate evolution, keep it vague and force the person who challenges you to prove that it couldn't happen that way.
and then say, well, it must have happened that way. Otherwise, you have to postulate some idiotic things such as miracles or God or some, something completely unscientific. So the only reasonable course of scientific research is to search for a material explanation. The whole basis of science is searching for a material explanation. Uh, for years, religionists have said, no, God does it, God does it. But the scientists have gone on patiently seeking material explanations and look at all the discoveries they've made. One discovery after another. And these religious people never discovered anything. They just stayed in their churches and died of smallpox and the Black Plague and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> you know, they never did anything. Uh, we'd still be in the Dark Ages if we left it up to them. So by looking for material explanations, science has made so much advancement. So we're saying here, in this area of life, sure, everything's complicated. Of course, we don't understand everything yet. But that's the nature of science. We push forward into the unknown, seeking material explanations. We don't concern ourselves with these occult, vitalistic explanations that are completely fruitless and never proved anything. So, therefore, we may not have it completely worked out yet, but the obvious program of scientific progress is to search for a material explanation of evolution in terms of physical processes. So unless you can prove that it couldn't happen, then we should certainly go on with this scientific program. And of course, if we listen to you, we'll all just go away somewhere, give up science, and spend our time praying or something. And what's the use of that? If we do that, all the more advanced nations who stick to the material path will beat us completely, and then we'll just have to uh, become slaves of them. So therefore, the theory of evolution is the only way. So... Pretty convincing. <laughs> yeah, but what does this argument have to do with the truth anyway? And what does it really have to do with science? Because the, this hype that I just gave you completely overlooks the fact that in science one is supposedly looking for the truth. And if you can't actually find the truth, then what have you got? Just a lot of baloney. And they complain about the religionists producing all kinds of superstitious gobbledygook that no one can, can prove or verify and so forth. But what are they doing? They're using the smoke screen that I just gave you to uh, back up this whole scheme that they've erected out of the, um, their imagination with no solid foundation. And they're saying, uh, yeah, either remain sitting or leave permanently. One or the other. Clear-cut decision. So, uh, so this is the, the thing that they're doing. They're creating a bluff and saying all kinds of unverifiable things. And this is not the way of science. In science, what you're supposed to do is show something that really works. And uh, it has to be evaluated on the spot as to whether it really works or not. And if it doesn't really work, then that's no good. That's the way you deal with things in science. If a chemist gives you some vague theory about what chemical reactions might do, and tells you that you have to prove that it's wrong if you're going to not believe in it, but he can't give you any evidence as to, to show that it's true, then you're certainly not going to accept that in chemistry. So, but the evolutionists have gotten people to accept this in this area of explanations of the origin of life. So, and there are various other points to make here. Uh, there are many examples of things, by the way, that are rather hard to explain by evolution. Like, we give this little shrimp example here. There are thousands of examples like this, but I'll just tell you what this one is. And then I'll, well, actually, that's the trouble. This thing tends to go on for some time. The thing is that I would rather you took time and did more classes than try to rush through it. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is, like I say, we're taping it, it's valuable for the devotees, so rather than you feel, well, I've got to end it, you know, 
You know, he does the job, so we have to make certain time. But I don't think we should feel there's a restriction on the number of times we give class on Tuesday. We should just systematically go through it. Because it's you know, well, there are a lot of a lot of details, and it's it's good to understand the the basic arguments here, because um, basically the evolutionary position is quite weak, but they can throw so many different things at you, like they'll throw at you the embryonic teeth of the baleen whales. <laughs> this is something we have illustrated here. Uh, adult whales, or, or whales that are actually swimming around and, and eating and so on, of this kind, don't have teeth. They have a sort of strainer in their mouths. What they do is they uh, swallow a huge uh, volume of water with very large mouths, which contains lots of little swimming things. Then they squirt the water out through this sieve, and the little creatures are caught in that, and then they swallow them, and that's how they eat. And so it's an interesting way to eat. But they don't have teeth. But the, the embryo partly develops teeth, and then they're reabsorbed into the body of the embryo before the whale is born. So the evolutionist will say, well, this is proof of evolution. It shows that the whales, these whales came from ancestors that had teeth. And uh, so I, want, I wonder, why don't they want to look into that? Of course, I can provide a, uh, an intuitive reason as to why they wouldn't want to look into that. Because the moment you really try to do it, you'll see that organisms are so complicated that the whole idea of evolution will become ludicrous. So, in order to have a theory of evolution, it's better to keep things vague. As long as an organism is a sort of vague, nebulous thing that you just imagine in a fuzzy sort of way, then you can imagine how it can evolve. Because anyone can imagine a sort of cloud of fuzz gradually changing shape from one thing into another. But uh, if you have an actual machine with moving parts that interact with one another, then how can you change that into something else, gradually, step by step? You know, you can take a wristwatch, or a sewing machine, or an automobile engine, and imagine changing that step by step into something else. For example, let's say we want to change a sewing machine into an automobile engine. Well, they are two organized structures. So, how could you do it? Now, the requirement is that at each step along the way, as you change the sewing machine into the automobile engine, you have to have a machine that works and does something. So, could you do it? That's a homework problem. Uh, you see, one thing scientists don't like, are, well, we're dealing with the subject of evolution here, and uh, the question is, how did the bodies of living organisms come into being in the first place? So, bodies of living organisms can be compared with complicated machines. In fact, the uh, Bhagavad Gita even makes that comparison, yantra rudani maya ya. The uh, word yantra means a machine, and actually, uh, in the old days in India, uh, there were rather complicated machines, not just bullock carts necessarily. Uh, I have an interesting little article written by some King Bojadev in the medieval period in Sanskrit. It's not a Shastra, it's just a secular piece of writing. But he's describing how the kings would have various uh, automata in their palaces. Uh, these are robots. Uh, but these weren't for the purpose of modern industrial development. They were mainly just for show and enjoyment. So, for example, it was described that they would have such a thing as a robot door opener. Uh, of course, we have these in supermarkets today. But this was fancier, uh, as is befitting for a king. <laughs> so you'd have this... Uh, uniformed soldier, and they think that that's the all-in-all. All. 
they believe that life is simply that machinery and that's all that is there now as it turns out the machinery in the in a living body is exceedingly complex we were talking about that previously I'll just explain what this picture is by the way see this picture here of a protein molecule in the beginning of this life from chemicals article well this is a simplified diagram of a protein molecule we show in here a scientist looking a little lost but uh, actually this looks like a ribbon like a sort of Christmas ribbon that's coiling around but actually this stands for a sequence of amino acids which are certain kinds of molecules that are linked together in a chain and the chain the ribbon follows the sort of path of the chain so you can imagine these rather odd shaped objects arranged in a chain fashion and going around following this path so that's what the whole thing is so it has a very complicated structure as you can see from the the picture if you imagine that actually this picture is a great simplification of what it really is and in even a bacterial cell there are thousands of different kinds of structures like this and each one is there in maybe thousands of copies but there are thousands of different types this small inset shows some of the different kinds of structures that exist and actually for the sake of the artist we just chose some that were standing next to the door at least it would look like a soldier but actually it wasn't a real soldier and as you walk towards the door he would lean over and open the door for you and close it after you but actually the whole thing was a machine and it was run apparently hydraulically there was a tank of water overhead and as you approached the door you'd step on a certain stone slab that would move down slightly and open a valve and then through the action of water flowing through this apparatus the, the whole thing would operate so actually one can build machines like that uh, you know with a bit of engineering skill you could see how to do it so apparently uh, well there are documents describing such things in India uh, and I don't, I don't know exactly in what period but a long time ago so anyway the idea of machines was not so novel so the uh, Bhagavad Gita describes the body as a machine but of course it describes that there's also the soul and the super soul and of course there's the subtle body as well as the gross body uh, the subtle body however also is essentially mechanical in nature it's uh, not living so it's also a kind of machine but the scientists of course only know about the gross machinery so and they're very much preoccupied with studying the machinery of the gross body for simple uh, if we chose the complicated ones then the picture would be too complicated and it wouldn't be good artistically so we didn't even show the really complex ones so the uh, machinery of the living body is exceedingly complicated and the fact is that no one really even can make a model of how it works what to speak of explaining how it came into being so I was just talking with this scientist yesterday who came to visit me here uh, about the whole question of making models of how uh, organisms actually work uh, we were also discussing the question of whether you could get funding for that from the different scientific agencies that are uh, run by the government and which determine uh, the flow of government funds for scientific research so we were discussing whether the people who are investigating the origin of life would approve such funding because what happens is that if you make a request for funding it's sent out to prominent scientists in the field of research that you're interested in and they say whether it's a good proposal or not and if, it, if they approve of it then you can get funding and otherwise you can't so uh, the point that came up though was that uh, they would never or they, they'd be highly unlikely to approve of uh, investigations in which you try to make models of how organisms work uh, 